new video. So good, watch a bit more. <laughs> uh, we have a new video uh, before the sermons uh, because we are moving on from lectionary sermons uh, to topical sermons. So all our topical sermons will be based on our church theme, uh, which is faith in praxis, living in faith. Uh, so today's passage is taken from Psalms chapter 19. So even though it's topical sermons, but of course we will still uh, be going through uh, passages in the Bible. Psalm chapter 19, uh, let me read to you. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth knowledge, uh, speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words, no sound. Is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun, and it is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It, run, it rises from one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, much more than pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you because, Lord, you are willing to speak to us. And this moment, as we come before you, Lord, we pray for the Spirit to guide us, that we may listen, that we may discern, and that, Lord, we may return to you. And all this we pray in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So today uh, is the first Sunday where we will start a new series of uh, topical sermons. And uh, all the topical sermons this year will be based on an overarching theme of worship. So all the sermons will be somewhat uh, either directly or indirectly related to worship. And uh, today I'll be preaching on the theme which is uh, Word in Worship. So why do we have uh, the Word in Worship? And next week, uh, Pastor Wilson will continue also on a different segment of worship, uh, which is on offering. So you can see that for the, the rest of this year, all the topical sermons um, will be talking uh, somewhat all related to worship, uh, except for some of the weeks which is uh, related to uh, the special days of the liturgical year. But otherwise, all will be topical sermons and somewhat related to worship. Now, if we were to preach uh, topical sermons, uh, worship seems like a very unusual choice because usually we preach topical sermons to be related to uh, Christian living, daily living, and it would be much more direct to talk about Christian living if we have chosen, let's say, current affairs, right? So easily applicable. So why? Why did we choose uh, worship as the theme for this year? I think we deliberately started with worship after the pastoral team uh, discussed on it because we believe that it is your relationship with God, which of course hinges on worship, which is the foundation of how you live your life. So if you want to talk about living, then first you need to talk about your relationship with God. Just as how the psalmist concludes in today's passage, what did the psalmist say? The psalmist says that things that it is... It's, it is his proper reverence to God that guides how he speaks, which is his daily living. Even how he thinks is related to his reverence with God. And that's why he says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. 
So we know that one of the key elements of worship is the word. Um, in a worship service, uh, there are many parts. In fact, almost all the parts are related to the word. Uh, the words of God can be found in the words of the liturgy, for example, in the call to worship, in the assurance of forgiveness. All this is, uh, comes from the word. And the word can also be embedded in our worship song. So, for example, just now our, our last song, Lord, my Lord, and uh, Rock, and my Redeemer, that comes from the last verse in Psalm 19. The words of God can also be uh, found in our prayers. But most of us, most of all, we know that uh, they are expounded, especially during the sermon time. So you can see that the way the entire worship service is designed, and we will have one sermon on how the worship service is designed, the word occupies a central uh, position in a worship service. And that, by the way, is a Presbyterian distinctive, all right? So um, it is not always this case, but because of uh, John Calvin, the word now really occupies a central position in uh, worship. It was John Calvin who says that the symbols in which the church is discerned, that means that what makes a church a church, uh, this is the key. Two things. First, it is the preaching of the word. Secondly, it's the observance of the sacraments. That means that as long, okay, at the very least, at, at the most crucial point, as long as you do your preaching right, you do the sacraments correctly, there you have a true church. Okay? That's how important it is. So the next time you sit through a long and boring sermon, you know who to blame. Oh, it's John Calvin. <laughs> Word is the central part of the sermon, of, of the service. So perhaps we would first ask the question: why? Why is the word so prominent in a worship? What makes um, John Calvin says that this is the crucial point of a service? The reason is simple. The reason is because God speaks. That is the answer. Okay? If, you, if someone who is a non-Christian asks you, hey, why is there a sermon in every worship service? This is your answer. Because God speaks. For the Jews, God speaks in two ways. The first, as we have read in Psalm 19, in the first six verses, it declares that creation itself is the revelation of God. God speaks through creation. And we learn this from Genesis chapter 1, that it is God's word that brought forth light, order, and abundant lives. The entire creation speaks of God's work. God speaks through the creation. It means that whenever we marvel at the beauty of creation, we should also sense the beauty of the Creator. And Paul states this clearly in Romans chapter 1. Paul says that since what may be known about God is plain to all people, that means what can be known about God, everybody should see it clearly. He says why? Because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, His divine nature, all this have been clearly seen and been understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. He says that whenever we marvel at the beauty of creation, it should make us also sense the beauty of the Creator. But of course, you might protest. You might say, God's revelation is in creation. Yeah, la, I, I like creation, la, but I'm not sure if I can know the Creator through the creation. It's too vague as a form of communication to us. Does it mean that oh, I see something beautiful? I see the mountains, the sea. I say, wow, there is a God. You might say, mm, well, it's too vague. Indeed, the psalmist also says the same. He says, yeah, true. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. It's not like when you see a beautiful mountain, then the mountain say, I am created by God. Oh, it's not. There's no words. And, th and throughout church history, the th theologians have also argued about this point, okay? Whether revelation 
true creation, what we call either natural revelation or general revelation. That's the theological term for it. Whether it is truly effective, does it really speak? Although the Bible says so, but does it really speak? There is, there is doubt about this effectiveness. And certainly now we live in a world where there are scientific you know, explanations for most of God's uh, nature's wonders, right? We, we know why is the thunder, we know why the, the sun moves, we know all this. And perhaps we have already taken grant, for granted about nature itself, whether it's the movement you know, of the sun across the sky, for example. We no longer think about it as you know, a, a, something that needs a creator. We no longer think about it as a form of divine providence, like what the psalmist declares. Yes, this beautiful creation is provided by God. But before we come to that conclusion, I would like to argue that perhaps it is not because it's not because God is not speaking, but rather it is us who are no longer listening. And in the process of us no longer listening, we have lost our sense of gratitude, we have lost our sense of delight in creation and also in the Creator. So this is my first point. If God speaks, then our first response must be to listen. The psalmist reminds us of the beauty of every sunrise, every sunset. Brothers and sisters, every sunrise and every sunset is God speaking to us. Day after day, they pour forth knowledge. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Every sunrise and every sunset speaks of the majesty and power of God. This is what the psalmist says. Only God is the one who can create everything by His will and purely by His command. All this happened purely because God speaks and it happens. Perhaps when the next time you are in a place with you know, less uh, light uh, pollution, look at the night skies. The stars and creation will reveal the infinity of God. The world is made perfect to live, to thrive. The fact that we can exist and live, this speaks of God's beautiful wisdom. So we must listen. We must hear God speaking to us through creation. All creation reveals the beauty of God because God wants to speak to us. In gratitude, let us also be reminded that all things, therefore, depend on the Word of God. It is the Word of God who sustains us to let existence continue, to let us live on. God speaks not only through creation, the Jews also believed that God speaks through His law. And this is why in Jewish worship, okay, so before Christian worship, of course, there is Jewish worship. In Jewish worship, there is a great emphasis on explaining the law. So you can think of it as that is the Jewish form of sermon. In their sermons, they talk about the law. They explain the law. And of course, what we are familiar with is the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments is actually what we call the table of contents. Okay? So in this law, there are ten chapters. right? The, table of, the Ten Commandments is just the table of contents for the covenant between God and His people. So we will spend some time this year to also talk about the Ten Commandments and what it has to do with us. That is the Jewish sermon, all right? So you can think of such legal exposition as sermons during Jewish worship. This is what the rabbis, the Pharisees, the scribes, this is what they have to do. And Jesus did the same on the Sermon on the Mount. So you can think of um, the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus' Jewish sermon. And whenever you, know, you will notice that whenever the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, and so on, when they, whenever ever the, they approach Jesus, whether it is to test him or they are genuinely uh, curious about his interpretation, it is always about what? Legal, uh, legal interpretations. That means how do we interpret this law? How do we interpret that law? Because Jesus is a rabbi. So in short, 
Sometimes we think that, oh, Jewish worship means, you know, all the sacrifices in the temple. No, not just that. The law, interpretation of the law, is their form of word. So as the psalmist says, you, you can appreciate why they find this so beautiful. The law is perfect, refreshing the soul. Basically, the law is what gives life. The statutes of the law are trustworthy, giving wise the simple. So, so this is what the Jews believe. The teachers of the law will help the people to live flourishing life. The, the fact that we can live well because God has spoken through the law. This is why we have a sermon series, therefore, on the Ten Commandments and how the uh, Christians should, be, should, should relate with the Jewish law. This, is, this will be done um, for the bilingual service. It will be done in October this year. So you might be wondering one point, uh, which is, eh? so how did the sermons of the Jewish, uh, Jewish worship of Judaism, how did you know, sermons which is about the law transform into, therefore, the sermon uh, of our Christian worship? Maybe we should also be talking about the law, <laughs> right? So what, how, what happened to this transformation? Now, to be fair, we also talk about the law, okay? Whenever we cover the Old Testament on God's will for life uh, or on society, we also cover uh, the law in a, in, a, in a certain way. But inevitably, we will, you will say that, hey, but most of the time we talk about who? We talk about Jesus, right? So most of the time we talk about Jesus. Why is there this transformation from law to Jesus? The reason is because Jesus himself declared in Matthew chapter 5, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. No, Jesus said, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. This is why we talk about Jesus. Jesus says that, For I tell you that unless your righteousness can surpass the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, our righteousness there, what we do uh, must be beyond even the, the Pharisees and the law. These people who, you know, every sermon is about the law. Eh. You might say, how can this be? How can our righteousness be beyond the Pharisees and the law? That is because we are supposed to fulfill our righteousness through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And therefore, this is why instead of talking about the law, we talk about Jesus. As, the, as John himself declared, no one has seen God but the one and only Son, Jesus, who is himself God and in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. So we believe that yes, God reveals, speaks through creation. We believe that God speaks through the law, but ultimately, the ultimate revelation of God is true, Jesus Christ. Jesus is what makes him fully known. And therefore, Jesus is the word of God. So now you see how the, this word thing transformed from law to Jesus. Jesus fulfills the law. So my first point is to listen. The second point is to discern. Listen, then discern. All our understanding of God, whatever we think that God is, um, when we listen and when God speaks to us, whether it's the sermons, a message from the sermons, or everything that we listen, all this must be distilled, must be filtered through the most important uh, lens, which is Jesus Christ. We must discern through Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Word made flesh and made his dwelling amongst us which means that in jesus christ we have god himself the word um, being with us reconciling himself to us dwelling with us that means walking among us in human form the church is born by god in the new testament to become the children of god how through jesus christ that means that the essence of church is because of jesus so this is why our, all our sermons therefore now, you know, transform 
transformed to be about Jesus because Jesus is the reference point from now on to ascertain and to, to, to discern all truths. The church relies on the word Jesus for life. So therefore, every single service, we proclaim and we witness God's word through Jesus Christ. That becomes the sole purpose of why the church exists, because of Jesus Christ. This, so, so now you understand why John Calvin says that as long as you have proper preaching of the word, as, as long as you have proper sacraments, which is the, the, the visual aspect of a, of a sermon, then you have the church. Because as long as the word exists, the church exists. So therefore we must listen because that is God speaking to, to, to you, whether it is through a worship service, whether it's through your observation of creation, whether it is through your daily prayers and devotion, God will speak to you, yes. That is where you must listen. But after listening, you must discern. And how well you discern, whether you can you know, capture the truth that comes from God, that ultimately depends on how well you know Jesus Christ and how close is your relationship with Jesus. So therefore, all our sermon must be about Jesus. Lah. Otherwise, you cannot discern. You listen already, you might you know, form your own interpretation. No. Listen, then discern through Jesus Christ. So the first point is to listen. The second point is to discern. My third point is to return. Listen, discern, return. What does return mean? Return means turn back to God. Lah. Because our understanding is not true transformation unless it is followed up with action. And the action must be according to our understanding. So the psalmist confess, keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. So I think that what is the issue? Why, do, why are lives not transformed? Why do we not have spiritual growth? I don't think it's really our understanding that is the problem. Our sermons are not complicated at all. You can understand. I don't think understanding is the problem. I think ultimately it's our reluctance to act. We don't want to change. We don't want to return. Paul says the same representing all humanity he declares this in romans chapter 7 he says that i know that the the good in itself does not dwell in me that is my sinful nature paul says i have the desire to do what is good but i cannot carry it out for i do not do the good that i want to do but the evil that i do not want to do this i keep on doing this is what paul declares on behalf of all humanity but, but despite this, let us also note that Paul did not just stop there. Paul did not say, ah, oh, I cannot do it, too bad. Paul did not do that. Paul did not just give up because he knows that humanity is inclined towards sin. Paul did not stop there. He, he, he says, yes, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subjected to death? Yes, he acknowledged his sinful nature. But Paul continues to say what? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. That means that he believes that this is our salvation. It, we, humanity doesn't end with our sinfulness. No, we must move from our sinfulness through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so my final point after to listen, to discern is to what? is to return. We must always, after listening, we must always return. Return to who? Return to Jesus, lah. Jesus our Lord. Our main action is to go back all the time to Jesus Christ. We listen, we discern, we return. We listen, we discern, then we return. Every single time. It is about fine-tuning ourselves once again to be aligned towards Jesus Christ. Every time you listen, you listen, you return. 
return, return, return. Allow me to quote from um, John Calvin why this frequent, I call this uh, direction resetting. Okay? Every single return is to reset towards Jesus, reset towards Jesus. Why is this frequent resetting so important? Allow me to quote from John Calvin. It's a long quote, but personally, I, I find it very moving. This is what John Calvin says. He says, let that target be set before our eyes at which we earnestly, uh, we earnestly, sorry, let that target be set before our eyes at which we are earnestly to aim. So basically, this, what is this target? This target is the life of Jesus. So every time we will set this target, all right, I've, I've discerned Jesus, let me return to Jesus. Every time we have this target, he says, this is the, the point, all right? You, you might say, I, uh, I'm sinful, uh, how can I be Jesus? No, always return, set this target. He says, let that goal be appointed to words in which we should strive and struggle. John Calvin says, no one in this earthly prison of the body has sufficient strength to press on with due eagerness, okay? So he admits, yes, nobody can say, I, I'm going to do it. Oh, then you become like Jesus. No, nobody, as long as you have this body, you cannot do it. You don't have this strength to do it. Okay? Your, he says, your weakness so weighs down uh, the greater number that with wavering, with limping, okay, even with creeping on the, on the ground, all right, your, your, your weakness is so great, okay, that you just move at feeble rate. Every time you say, I return, uh, I return, uh, like, like creeping, okay, every time it's like that. He admits this is our situation. Every time you say we return, you just uh, a little bit, okay? But then he says what? He says, let each one of us then proceed according to the measure of his puny capacity. So, okay, every time it's a little, uh, a little bit, okay, a little puny capacity, but set out upon the journey we have begun. So, yes, because of our sinfulness, every time it's a puny little bit, but you do it. This is what John Calvin says, you do it. He says, no one shall set out so inauspiciously as to not daily make some headway, though it be slight. That means that even though, yes, it's a tiny bit, but he says, every day a tiny bit, every day a tiny bit, 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 bit. every day a tiny bit, there's no way you can say that you don't make any change, transform. He said, no, not possible. If every day a tiny bit, surely there will be a change. He says, therefore, let us not cease to act that we may make some unceasing progress along the way. Just because you say it's puny, you don't do. Ah. Some people are like that. Then, of course, ah, nothing changed. He says, no, let us not cease to do that. Okay, even though it is very slight. No. Let us not despair at the slightness of our success, even though attainment may not correspond to desire. Yes, we say, wow, oh, I so much effort already. I, I just transformed a puny bit. Let us not do that. Just stop because of that. He says, when today outstrips tomorrow, uh, sorry, when today outstrips yesterday, the effort is not lost. Every day we return to God, even though it's just a puny bit, but as long as today is better than yesterday, John Calvin says the effort is not lost. The effort is not lost. The effort is what matters. Every day a puny bit. Only let us look towards our mark with sincere simplicity and aspire to our goal. Every day we say, yes, I will turn towards Jesus. Not fondly flattering ourselves, oh, you see, oh, I'm so good, oh, every day I, I read my, my Bible. No, not flattering ourselves. Not excusing our evil deeds, okay? Not say, hey, every day I try already, I, how, how, you know, not excusing our evil deeds but with continuous effort, striving towards this end. John Calvin says that we may surpass ourselves in goodness until we attain goodness itself. So yes, lah, this, is, this strive towards the life of Jesus is a lifelong journey. But every day, 
We do it, do it, do it, until one day we, we meet Jesus. It is this, John Calvin says, indeed, through the whole course of life that we seek and follow. But John Calvin says, we shall attain it only when we have cast off the weakness of the body and are received into the full fellowship with Jesus. So this is, this is what it means. Every day, we listen, we discern, and then we return. Every single day, we listen, we discern, then we return. In fact, this is the role of every sermon speaker, is to, is to let you listen, discern, and return. This is, this is what every sermon is about, to allow God to speak to you. And your role, therefore, will be to? Eh, first is, listen, then, discern, then, return. If you have been in church long enough, most sermons will eventually become a reminder of what you already know. If the, if, if the pastor is thinking, saying something new, uh, it can be quite dangerous. <laughs> or if you have been in church long enough, all sermons eventually becomes just a reminder. Yeah. Especially so if the pastor is faithful to the word. All right. So it's okay if you already know it. That means the pastor is doing his job. <laughs> but despite, but do not, but as John Calvin said, do not despise this weekly returning to God. Do not despise this. If you do it often enough, it's never in vain. And if you don't, in fact, if you give up, that is worse. You might have already turned away from God. You say, oh, why should I return? Turn, return already, I turn back, return already, I turn back, return, I turn back, I don't return already. That, that's even worse. So I hope that, and this is why we, this year we start with worship. That is our foundation. We hope to bring true transformation to the entire Jubilee community. And when all of us, eventually, everybody, dun, 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 eventually when all of us is fully aligned, our, fully aligned back towards Jesus Christ, returning to Jesus, slowly but surely, we will become the salt and light of the world. So as the psalmist says, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we want to pray for your spirit to guide us and give us strength. Lord, we acknowledge our weakness. We acknowledge that we are, we are but mere sinful creatures. But Lord, we know it will not be in vain because of Jesus Christ. Jesus, our Lord and our Redeemer, has rescued us that we can come back to you. What gracious, what, what great, great grace is this? We thank you. And Lord, help us in our daily walk with you that eventually we may see you again. And all this we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.